it's a beautiful day to continue with the Sermon on the Mount. And before I get started in the next section, I, I want to encourage you to look back at section one and section two. Um, as we're working through maybe the most groundbreaking sermon taught of all time, Jesus is teaching very countercultural ideas to a people who are God's people, but who have been loosely following the rules for thousands of years. They've gotten themselves in trouble. Jesus has come and said, look, it's not an actions-based religion. It's a heart issue. And as I went back and I reviewed section one and section two, part one and part two, because I, I don't want to, I don't want to lead you with anything egregious. I don't do a lot of preparation here. I just sit down and talk to you about what the Bible means to me, what it says to me. I, I realized that I failed to cover one of the most important verses in this sermon. It's the whole point of why I do what I do. Why do I take the time to record these and put these out? But besides loving the word of God and teaching it, I, I am here to further the kingdom of God. Look at what it says. It was back in that section where we were talking about being salt and light. Remember, Jesus said, this is how I want my people to react. I want them to be a salt, a preserving factor to stop the decay of society. And I want, to be a, I want them to be a light. I want them to shine in darkness. Verse 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. The point is, is that I am, I've been given talents to understand, to have discernment. The Spirit leads me on, gives me a passion to teach a word of God. And although they say, you know, avoid the ministry if you can, but oh, woe to you if, you, if, if you're led or called to the ministry and yet not, and, and you don't heed the warning or heed the call of God. There's nothing I can do. I am so enthralled by this word and to teach it to others that even if nobody saw him, I can't stop doing that. There's a point. It's not to get my face out there. It's for you to see the change in my life, to be a witness. Jesus told me to be a witness to him to everywhere. And if this is the only place that I can minister to, then so be it. God will bless it. He has. He's told me. So part of my heart for these videos is for you to share them with others, is for you to use them as teaching points, for you to you do whatever you want with them because the word of God is important and time is running out. So I want you to see the changes in my life and I want you not to praise me, but to praise God because God owes all. I, I, owe, I owe the glory and honor and praise for his changes in my life to him and him alone. There is no other thing that I can give my praises to Jesus Christ, my Savior and Lord, and the King who will return. So realize that it's important for us to shine the light before men, that they would see that light and turn to God. That's the point. But we'll continue in verse 33 as we move on to part 3. This section of scripture, to finish out chapter 5, one of three chapters that's in this sermon, talks about oaths and being wronged and reconciliation and how to handle your enemies. There's a lot of people I know that probably need to hear this kind of a thing because this is really countercultural to what we've been teaching each other for so long. Verse 33 says, again, you have heard... Remember what we hear. Jesus says, you have heard because the law says, the teachers have said, time frames have passed and have said one thing. But I, as Jesus coming to you to change the narrative in this sermon, tell you something else. And most, most often it's let's change the behavioral issue, the physical behavior to show that you're you have piety towards God to a heart issue, to, to get internally first, because the internal change is what's most important for us as people. So again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. He's saying, don't make false, don't promise falsely. Don't make us don't swear on something and then not do it. The, the Bible says, 
Don't do that. That's a sin. If you promise someone you're going to do it, make sure you do it. If you're going to swear to it, and I'm not, I'm not talking about profanity. I'm talking about swearing an oath to something. If I if I give my oath to do something, then do it because you've you've wronged your brethren and you've wronged God. If you have, that's what he's saying. Don't do that. Don't swear falsely. Uh, make sure you take care of your oath. But Jesus takes it from the physical, if you say it, do it, so you're okay, to saying this, I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven or by God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Now you've got to realize that the Pharisees, you can't swear to God. I swear to God. No, you can't do that. That's a sin. But I can swear to... They were, they were circumventing that sin by saying, Oh, I swear to the temple. I swear to the money in the temple. I, I swear to on earth. I swear to the plant. I swear on my mom's grave. I said, whatever. Whatever. And Jesus is saying, don't do that at all. Don't swear at all. For a reason. It says, don't share... But, you know, nor shall you swear by your head because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. He's saying, don't swear on anything, don't promise anything. Just your ability to tell the truth and your ability to carry it out should be your word. Integrity is key here because the minute you start, the minute you start adding this is easy. Police work is full of this. I swear to God that this happened. I swear to God I didn't steal it. I swear to God. I swear. I. Ugh. The minute you start swearing and telling me that on, on some higher power that that you didn't do something, I start to become suspicious because I, I you don't have any integrity. Your, your yes is not yes. Your no is not no. If if I ask you to do something and you say I will do it, then do it. Because you're doing that before God. You don't have to promise me. You don't have to swear on God's name that you'll do it. Because what happens if you don't? Then you have drugged God into this and God has no place in this. This is your integrity speaking. We have to get back to a society of, of integrity. Because deception is everywhere. Jesus told us in, 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 in the Olivet Discourse, don't be deceived. See to it that you're not deceived by all of this stuff going on and you're watching it out there. How bad does it make you feel when you don't know the answer? Don't be that person. Have integrity. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And don't add anything of it. Develop your personality so that people know by integrity that you are who you say. Verse 38 says, <clears throat> you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The law said that if you bust somebody's tooth out, then someone could turn around and bust the tooth out of you. Now, this isn't necessarily a physical act, but what this means is, is that if you wrong someone, the punishment has to fit the crime. They have to be equal. So if an eye for an eye, if I stab your eye, you get to stab my eye. It's no more than that. It's just that much. That's to keep people from going over, over, you know, to, to be to bring vengeance over and beyond what they paid for. It's it's a court issue. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna be if I'm gonna lose something and you're gonna do you're gonna lose if, if you're gonna do something about me and to, against me and I lose, then I get to take it back from you. I get restitution. That's what that is. An eye for an eye. Jesus says, You have heard it said. The Bible the the that's that's a physical act that if something happens to you, you can dole out the same punishment back to them so that it's equal. It keeps you from going overboard. But here's what Jesus said back to the heart issue. I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. This is, this is maybe one of the most countercultural points he makes in his sermon. Because we don't like when we've been dealt with unjustly. That's the midst of the social justice problem that people for hundreds of years have been wrongfully 
handled and we need to somehow make it right. That's not what Jesus is saying. First Corinthians chapter six, Paul says, why not just be wronged? If they wronged you and it was a problem, go to him and make it right. But, but don't seek vengeance and don't seek, don't seek to make it right. Make peace and forgive and move on. This is hard to do. Now, of course, Paul is talking in the fact of dealing with other Christians. It's really hard to do this. Someone who is carnal, someone who doesn't believe in God, someone who doesn't have the heart of Jesus, somebody who doesn't love, because they're going to be their animalistic self. And when you don't have, when you don't have the forgiveness of the Father in heaven, then you can't forgive others because you, you don't understand, gosh, you don't understand the gravity of the situation. If someone slaps you on the face, turn your cheek. That doesn't mean become a punching bag. What Jesus means here is, is let it go, forgive it, and give God the opportunity to fix it. Because the Bible says, vengeance is mine, I shall recompense. We don't go on vengeance, not as a Christian. Our heart is to forgive and give, let God take care of it in his way because he is just and merciful and he knows how this works. That's the whole point of the book of Jonah. Jonah, Jonah is asked by God to go to the wicked people of, of, of Nineveh and Assyria and tell them they're going to be destroyed. <laughs> and he knew, he knew, Jonah knew that that God would be merciful if they turned to him. And so he ran away because he didn't want to be a part of that transaction, that forgiving transaction. Well, he ends up doing so anyway. After he gets swallowed by a fish and he understands his wrong, God says, go to Nineveh and do that. Well, they, they repent and they're saved and God is merciful and saves the whole city. And Jonah doesn't understand why. And he says, I'm the one who can make these decisions. You're not. You're, you're, a, you're a sinful man who, doesn't, who, who sees the world through a keyhole. But I have the whole picture. Jesus would later talk about those people in, in the book of Jonah. He said, the people of Assyria, that generation that saved themselves, they're going to be in heaven. Wicked people in heaven because they, well, they were saved. A hundred years later, Nineveh was destroyed because they were wicked. But that little group of people talked to by Jonah who turned and found the Lord were saved. And Jesus talks about them, gives them great, gives them great kudos for that. Look, Go the second mile. Stand up and walk with someone in their trials and difficulties. If they've wronged you, be strong about it. Stand up and be wronged so that you can make peace with others. Because, because finishing the war by getting into this tit-for-tat problem and making it even only creates strife for the rest of your life. Take it from me, I've got relationships like that. Where they were wronged. I was wronged and then I... Then I somehow wronged them. They said I wronged them. Well, we, we made it all out and it was done, but we've not talked since. Where, where is the value in that in the kingdom of God? Give to him who asks of you from him who wants to borrow from you. Do not turn away. Look, <clears throat> if someone needs something, give it. Nothing you own is yours. Everything you own is God's. And allow to help those who need, put them, in, put them in, in help. It's the heart of Christ to help those in need. And he may use what you have to help others. And in doing so, you get that good feeling, you bear up treasures in heaven, and you will see the goodness and graciousness of God. The point is here, realize that God forgave you you need to forgive them. Remember, Jesus died on the cross, but he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that was after a statement Jesus said, it's like when, when they're arresting him and Peter tries to cut Malchus's ear off, he says, don't you understand? I could call down a hundred legions of angels to protect me if I wanted. Jesus had all the power to do anything he wanted to. He was tremendously wronged. And he up, up until the point where he died. But on the cross he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he died. 
We have to live that way. We have to have a heart for that. A strong person stands in forgiveness. A, a strong person doesn't have to strike back. Only weakness comes that way. Interestingly, um, Warren Wiersbe says in his commentary, it says, psychologists tell us that violence is born of weakness, not strength. It is the strong man who can love and suffer hurt. It is the weak man who thinks only of himself and hurts others to protect himself. He hurts others, then runs away to protect himself. Don't retaliate. Let God take care of it. Well, verse 43, we get into a section about loving your enemies. Now, this is really hard, too. It says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, that's what everybody wants to do. Love, your, love those who are who are important to you, love your neighbor, who are your friends and your family, hate those who have brought, who have brought it against you, right? One of your enemies. But remember what we said, <clears throat> we're not supposed to retaliate. So when Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love yourself, the definition of who your neighbor is, is any person made in the image of God, which is humankind, any human who is nearby, Everybody is your neighbor, and you are to love them in that way. And you have to realize that because God loved you, you are to love others, regardless of whether they like you or not. That's the whole point of, of, of Jesus' heart for people. How, do, how, how does he come in here and change the heart of someone so that they have more and more of the heart of Christ? That's, that's what he's trying to do. All of this is countercultural because it doesn't make sense. We want justice. We want, we want justice. We want equity. We want equality. We want all these things. But Jesus never, ever, ever, ever said anything like that here. He said, love your neighbors, love your enemies, love everybody. And in doing so, you will heap hot coals on your head. <laughs> now, that doesn't make any sense now. But back then, the most important thing you had in your house were burning coals. And if your fire went out, you were, you were in trouble because you couldn't cook your food and keep your house warm. So you went to your neighbor and you asked for a couple of embers. Well, you'd put them in a bowl and you'd keep them on your head and you'd carry them back to your house. You'd heap hot coals on your head. But what he's saying is, is the minute someone wrongs you, but you turn around and, 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 and forgive them and you're good back to them, that you love them, that you love your enemies... And maybe we should go back into here and this says what it says. This is what Jesus said. Remember, the, the law said what you have heard is, what you understand is, what you think is right is, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Whew, that's heavy because... When, the minute someone wrongs you and you forgive them and you're nice back to them, you pray for them, you take care of them, you do good things for them, you are nice to them, then they're left with the guilt of wondering why you aren't fighting back. Well, and in doing so, you've given them something really important. You, you've heaped hot coals on their head. I would far rather be wronged and then have them have the conviction or the condemnation, depending on how you want to look at it, of having to owe me something because I was nice back. I, I didn't fight back. I didn't sink to their level. I took the high road. <clears throat> I like what he says here about God. He says, for he, that's God makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? What what reward have you? I, I God sends the sun and the rain. He sing, he brings he brings blessing on everybody, good and bad. And, and you have to do that too. If you're trying to be this, if you're trying to be conformed to the image of His Son, and Jesus is God in human flesh, then then we need to look to bless even those who are wrong. <laughs> we have to look to bless those who've wronged us. Look. There's a, there's a point in all of this because some of this happiness comes from, is developed in you. You can't be bitter and thankful at the same time. You can't. You have to choose one. You live a bitter, a bitter or hurted life or you let it go 
you forgive and be thankful. It's your choice. You, you, there's not, there's nowhere to go in that. And what he's saying is, is because God, because God, the creator, the really smart one, the one who knows all things outside of time, knows what he's doing and, and, and has all this to come. Well, he gives good and bad things to everybody, good and bad alike. He lets the sun shine and the rain fall on the just and the unjust. So who are you to say how you handle other people? Because part of this kind of says, well, you know what? If I, I'm, because God, God says he's going to bless him. But if I was God, I wouldn't bless him. I would, I would strike him down with thunder, lightning. I'd bring fire from heaven. It sounds like John and James, the sons of thunder. It's like, do you want me to call down fire from heaven on these guys for calling me a mean name? That's not Jesus' heart. Jesus' heart says, I'm the one who will take care of those people. You just do what I say. I have forgiven you. You forgive them. I, I, I promise you, it makes all the difference in the world. I'm getting to the point where I, I hold no animosity towards anything because, because God takes care of me. And every time someone comes against me and I, and I don't fight back and I let them take me down and I let them have the last say and then I pray for them, one, I, can't, I really can't pray for someone I'm angry at. Once I do, I feel better. And two, something always happens and God, God kind of makes a fool of them. And I, and, and it's not for something that them, that for them to see, it's something for me to see. And I say, look, God is so good. Look, he's taking care of my issue for me. I didn't have to fight that way. And I don't feel guilty. And I, I'm not in, I'm at peace with where I am. And why is that important? Because I let my light so shine among men that they see my good deeds and they bless and praise God in heaven. That's the point. That's the point. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do before? What do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. What he's saying is, is how special are you if you love your family and you hate your enemies? You're no different than anybody else. If if you only if you only get into your holy huddle at church and those are the only people that you hang out with, you don't eat you don't eat dine with sinners like Jesus did. You don't you don't reach out to the to the the disenfranchised, those on the the fringe. If you don't look to help those who are in need, even if they're sinners, then what good are you? What what difference are you? God is saying, stand up and be at a higher level than other people. I love all of them and I've put them and I put you in their place to help them because I give you the word and only the word through the spirit can come to other people. Who cares if you love your family? Do you love your enemy? That's the, that's the sign. That's the signature of a Christian who does the right thing, who is salt and light in this earth. Oh, you just want to go talk to just Christians, but you want to stay away from those who are damaging to society? What good are you? You're supposed to be the salt and light of this world. And it took me a long time to learn this. Because even as a police officer for the tw first 12 years of my career, I didn't care. I just wanted to put you in jail. And if, and if you did wrong, you paid for it. I was the law. But Jesus changed me. Jesus, Jesus took me to another place. I started reaching out to those who, who were really struggling. Alcoholics, drug addicts, the mentally ill, women who are on welfare, Section 8, single moms, the homeless, vets. People who are disenfranchised, people who wouldn't even lift a finger to help them if you cared. I started to come into contact with them all the time and I started to love on them. And God makes all the difference in the world because one of those men told me the other day I was one of the kindest people he's ever met that I saw something in him that he didn't see in himself 
It's not me. But let my life so shine among men that they would see my good deeds and they would praise God in heaven for doing what he does. This is all not me. This is, the, this is Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit in heaven only. What good is it if you're not looking to preserve the, the, the purity of God's word in a world that is decaying rapidly? That's what, our, that's what being a witness of Jesus means. So love your neighbors, love your enemies, love those you don't. If you got a $10 bill, give it to the woman on the corner with five kids who's trying to make it work. That little bit of money will go a long way. Jesus can make a little thing go far. Remember the fish and the loaves. And if I, as I finish here, it needs to be said about verse 48. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And, and so many times everybody says, well, I can't be perfect and therefore forget it. I can't be perfect. The Bible tells me I can't be perfect, but the, this isn't the word perfect. It's not to be perfect. It's to be completed. It's to be, it's to be more mature, spiritually grown. And we can't, be, we can't be even spiritually perfect on this side of eternity because our flesh and our sins... Our flesh, which is still sinful, it hasn't been it hasn't been resurrected yet until we're given our body in the in the resurrection, right in the in the in the coming rapture. But our soul has been regenerated, and they battle. The Bible says that our soul battles against the spirit for over. I'm sorry, the soul battles against the flesh because of sin. Our body wants sin. It's carnal, lustful, hungry, prideful arrogant it wants everything it wants in this world because that's what the flesh wants the spirit does not the spirit seeks after the things of god if you have been regenerated that's the whole point jesus said that don't fall into temptation the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak this is the battle that we always battle and so it doesn't mean be perfect it means be further mature and to be developed that's what god wants us to do up into the point that we are just like Jesus Christ, his son. In Philippians chapter 1, it says, He who has begun the good work will be faithful to finish that work until the coming of Christ. This is the heart of Jesus, to get people who are countercultural, to stand on a way and, a, and, and stand in a, in a form that, is, that stands above the decrepitcy of this world. To bring love and, and, and honor and grace and Christ to a dying world. To be countercultural so that when people see you and see your good works, that they glorify God in heaven. We'll finish here today and we'll pick up in chapter 6 next time. Be blessed this week and I love you.